quick. Ba, 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 ba. I need my terminal. Come on, Twitch. You're muted. Okay, cool. I was testing the mute. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we are, we're good. Okay. One, just 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, okay. You ready? Let's go. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 245 of the Security Podcast here on the In30 Network. Tom, I don't know where Tom is, but for me, he's there. Uh, I'm here. Oh, this somewhere. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, right here. Uh, Tom does overlays. So we're recording in one app and it's overlaying on Twitch to make it look really better. I would like to, I think, we have to thank Jake from State Farm for doing that. Jake from State Farm, indeed. I wonder what Jake from State Farm is wearing right now. I would imagine some type of khaki is in a red shirt, but I could be wrong. Like, I think that the, I think the pant, stocks or pants drop significantly, but tops, like, I think Jake from State Farm is wearing his red polo top, but he's probably wearing some like umbro shorts or something like that. Or khaki boxers. Khaki boxers. So, I mean, you know what? One of the things of this pandemic is I'm wearing more casual clothes and the laundry bill has gone down and I don't want to buy new clothes for work. So I'm happy with that. Anyway, this is episode 245 and we're going to try something really ambitious. We didn't do that much research. We tried our best, but we understand this is for basic. This is basics. I have a do I took a whole 16 week course on this. But it's we want to talk about the difference and why Apple moved from Intel to whatever they call it, Apple Silicon or ARM or whatever you want to call. It. Basically, they're moving processors. So, does Tom want to add a disclaimer before we start? Uh, I I don't really have like a massive disclaimer. I'll have a bunch of little disclaimers as we go along. Um, but I guess the biggest disclaimer is. We are not processor experts. We are not experts on instruction sets. We are not experts in all those things. And we do not have any inside information when it comes to Apple, Intel, et cetera. Yeah. I literally just spent a few hours on Wikipedia today diving into things and looking at press releases. So uh, so I could be a little bit more informed about you know the information we're, we're bringing all of you. Uh, if you would like to know more, Wikipedia and the related links uh, down in like the, you know, linked linked sources section that's uh, a great place to go i mean i took computer architecture many many years ago uh probably 15 or 15 years ago at this point i'm not saying again i'm not an expert but i think i have enough to give you a general idea so let's start back in 1984 apple uh steve jobs and uh wozniak came together they said we're going to build a company they built they made their own chip Okay, let's fast forward. They they worked with uh, IBM on PowerPC. That was your old Max. They ran on PowerPC. They were the fastest at the time, which back in the mid '90s and all that was good. And then the problem came. I run. A, I want to run Office. I want to do these things, and you couldn't do it. And that was a big hindrance for a lot of people that you couldn't run certain things. That's where. That's where Apple was known for creative people and and uh, Windows was known for business people type thing. In 2005, Apple said, we are switching to Intel. And that was a huge, that was, I, I mean, I got, I, I, that's when I basically switched to Macs. And Intel allowed Windows to run. But now... It, on, through bootcamp, through this, they had the same code base, all this. Okay, now we're fast forwarding to 2009, uh, 2020, and Apple is saying, you know what, Intel, it's been a good run, uh, but we want to control more of the uh, the chipset. We're going to make our own chips. And I think that this is a good idea. So I'm going to ask Tom just really quick, uh, two lines, five words, phrase, is this a good idea? I'm going to say yes. Okay. 
I think, look, I think it is. I Apple is known for controlling everything. I think they want to do that. And I think they're going to be good stewards of controlling everything that they make because so far they've shown that they want to make a really good product. And yeah, we've bashed them on the show here and there and the bad keyboard or the lack of ports and everything else. But overall, you still have an iPhone. You still, people still buy Macs and people have a general positivity towards Apple. So I think that moving forward is going to be a positive idea. So now this is where it gets a little difficult. What is a, a processing chip? So I'm going to start with, there's two types of uh, what we're going to call instruction sets. So an instruction set is the list of instructions that make the silicon work. Okay, and I asked Tom to verify one or two before. One of them was like an add function. You wanna add two numbers. You had to write how to do that. A store function. How do you store a variable to get things done? And there are billions of these instruction sets at this point. There's a lot, let's just say there's a lot. There's a so, whole lot. So let's start with C, CISC. So I said, you told me that I was wrong. So what does CISC stand for? Uh, CISC is the uh, complex uh, instruction set computer. Okay. So that I'm going to go on a limb and say, that is, that is all the instructions, all of them, every single one that can be done. Okay. That is all, those are the ancillary instructions. Those are the appendices. Those are the forwards. That's the index. It's all of them. Okay. But you don't want that because here's the thing. So, so why do you need all of that? If you only need half of them, why don't you make a chip with a reduced or risk reduced instruction set computing and and this is what arm back and arm is not that old arm may be like 15 years old now decided to do arm said you know what we're gonna make and and tom's gonna explain to me what arm is in a second but arm said we're gonna make this open source chipset and everyone who can do it can use this reduced set of instructions however you have to license them to to make it work for yourself so that's why you have the a4 the a11x the a12z and the new uh, ipad pros you have the exynos you have uh the qualcomm chips you have all the all the other type of small chipsets you Launched have the raspberry by samsung broadcom yeah. broadcom does the raspberry pi chip so so far am i okay i'm so far i'm okay kind of so okay. you are accurate as of back in the day so okay. today, RISC versus CISC instruction sets, there's there's RISC platforms with, you know, as long or longer than CISC instruction sets. Um, and there's CISC instruction sets that are relatively tiny and compact. Um, the big difference today, and it's really all due to computing marching forward and people trying to get the best of both worlds. Um, the differences between a, com a complex instruction set computer and a reduced instruction set computer uh, is really kind of wishy-washy today. It's, it's really mixed together, it's mangled, uh, but generally the consensus is that a reduced instruction set computer is going to do the instructions in as little clock cycles as possible. Basically, for a complex instruction, you could take, you know, one, clock cycle to do something or 12 or you know as many as as it takes to complete that instruction whereas a risk architecture tries to doesn't have to but it tries to do their instructions in as little usually one in a clock cycle of a processor now again there are going to be exceptions and edge cases and other things that don't make sense because over time uh everything has just kind of gotten mangled into one what do we want this thing to do? How do we want it to do it? Can we use, you know, RISC and CISC in certain areas? Even modern Intel chips today use a RISC computer inside of the processor to do certain tasks because it's better suited to those things. Um, the general thinking is that you can have a really generic, uh, you know, complex instruction set computer that can do everything decently well, or you can have a reduced instruction set computer that is super optimized for a few tasks. Um, and that's the general lay of the land. Again, it's all kind of mished, mashed together because modern computing is fun. Well, look, it's uh, we've said this now for a while. Why have 
why does everyone need this big honking computer when you have when you when you can use a tiny computer for a raspberry pi for all these little different things why do you need an intel based whatever it is to run some relay switch or to run a server that holds your plex uh, or your movies or whatever it is when you can have a whole bunch of little raspberry pi 50 dollar computers doing all these little things and look, even Apple has their T2 chip and uh, even Android has their whatever little chip processor on it to do just the fingerprint uh, sensing, the secure enclaves. They're all little cores inside these computers with different instructions in the cores with all these little instruction sets to do very little. And the, the key benefit is power. They're saving a tremendous amount of power and battery. So, so to increase the battery life. So what what Intel is doing, and unfor it's unfortunate, is that they can't reduce the they can't increase their power efficiency. It's for whatever reason they are not doing well on it. And ARM companies, the, the different ARM manufacturers, are coming down with less with smaller cores, which translate into better efficiency. They're not as powerful, but if you're optimizing the code for your chip, we don't really care about power or we don't need it to be that powerful because you, we're writing specifically for it, right? Yeah, so a lot of ARM processors are gonna be way, way, way more power efficient just simply because they do less, right? Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, Intel inside of smartphones never really took off, right? They tried a lot. They tried really hard to try to make Intel on mobile platforms a thing. It's not going to be a thing. It's just not going to be a thing, at least not not in any foreseeable future that, that I can imagine. Um, so one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons why Apple is moving to this new architecture that they own and control is because they can do power management a whole lot better. If you have ever owned a MacBook, an Intel MacBook, you know that you open up Chrome, you open up Firefox, you start playing a video somewhere, your battery life just drops. It just tanks. Like you can watch that thing tick down because it, it just sucks power. Um, you know, your your iPhone with its incredibly stellar battery life for, you know, its early years at least. Um, you can think the, you know, the ARM chips that Apple put inside this thing because they're generally really, really power efficient. It's not the most efficient chip on the market, but compared to a desktop Intel chip, it's really good. I have a, I have a good analogy. Let's take back, go back to cell phones. Your job, a cell phone's job was to make a cell phone. That was it. Just make a cell phone. Just make a phone call. You flipped up your flip phone and made a phone call. Then Intel said, and we're going to use Intel for this example. Oh, let's add uh, text messaging to it. Okay, so now the Intel can say I can, I can text and I can call. The, oh, let's add internet browsing. Let's add apps. And the people who just want to make a phone call, you can still do it on this really expensive chip, or you can make your own chip and just make calls. And, and so instead of doing all these other things, it, you can recreate your chip and the software to just make calls again, and it will be super efficient, even though it is not as powerful. So that, I feel like that's what Apple is kind of doing there. It's, if you look at benchmarks, they're not, their chips are not going to beat the Intel, like the Mac pro or whatever their I nine or their I seven Z on core, but you may not need it. If it can do everything you're doing without you seeing a, a decrease in improvement, who really cares as long as you're getting better battery life. I mean, right. Yeah. To, to take, you know, that sort of thing where you're right. focusing on one problem domain and, just making it the most efficient thing you have ever imagined to take that to its logical extreme you get uh you know quite quite literally uh you know processors designed to do one thing and only one thing you get asics uh you you get processors designed to do one operation really 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 well in the metal in the hardware without any kind of software getting in the way or or slowing things down but it can only do that one thing if you've ever bought uh, ASIC Bitcoin miners, I own one, it's there in that drawer. Um, it can do Bitcoin mining really, really well. Can it do anything else? Not really, but that's okay. That's not why you bought the thing. Uh, an ARM computer uh, or, or a, a RISC processor, uh, you know, can do a small amount of these instructions um, or a large amount of these instructions, but very efficiently uh, compared to 
uh, a CISC machine, which is going to do a whole lot of things and be fairly generic to work with. Um, but you have that overhead, the, the complexity of dealing with it, and generally the inefficiency in some of the more complex instructions. It's not okay, a bad so, thing. It's just a trade-off. So now we have to get into, okay, and, and Tom's going to tell me I'm wrong right off the bat, is we had the problem of what you hadn't, if you go back to Chromebooks, you go back to the five, six years with Chromebooks, you couldn't run Skype. Skype just didn't work. We didn't know why it didn't. I mean, I knew why it didn't work, but Skype didn't work because it was because Skype was written for an Intel chip, but on an ARM chip, it didn't have the it didn't have the the instruction set, so it couldn't work. I, I want to start with Tom. Is that sort of correct? You're you're getting there. Okay. Um, so you can you can write software specifically targeted towards a particular architecture. If you know, okay, this piece of software is going to run on exactly this chipset with this instruction set with this version of the microcode, you can get down into assembly code for some of your your trickier and more performance sensitive areas of your application and write it specifically to target the die of that chip, specifically to target that hardware. And it's going to be blazing fast. The trade-off of that is that to get it to work anywhere else, you know, because it's assembly code, because it's written for that particular chipset or that particular instruction set, it's not going to be easily translated to something else without a complete rewrite. Now, in the case of Skype, right, the way they wrote it is, or, or the way they compiled it, I should say, um, is targeted towards the x86 platform, right? Modern Intel, modern AMD processors, as well as a couple others, but hmm. we're not going to talk about them. Um, but it targets the modern x86 instruction set. Um, to convert that over to ARM requires either recompiling the program, and hopefully it can be recompiled. Hopefully they're not doing anything kind of crazy with assembly code or non-portable C or whatever else they, they wrote it in. Um, but it's not exactly, uh, you know, I'm going to take this binary over here and drop it on this platform and expect it to work. The processors are quite literally speaking different languages in many cases, right? At the end of the day, it's all binary, but there's still that level of abstraction to, you know, what, what the chip is going to see and what the, your programs are written in. Um, so they're quite literally expecting different languages to be spoken, and it's not going to work if you just drop it on a platform that's not expecting it. So now the good thing is, is since that five years ago, Android has created or Chrome OS has allowed you to use the Android app store. If you buy a new Chromebook now, you literally can run Android apps. Oh, I mean, you wouldn't tell that they're not native to Chrome. They, they work really, really well. And that allowed amazing things like Office now on a Chromebook, which was unspeakable a few years ago. So, so why does that matter? Well, you can now run Skype on said Chromebook. And now you have Skype there because again, Hangouts is going to die and Skype is unfortunately still there in its many iterations. So I think what Apple is looking at is why are we paying Intel for, why are we reliant on Intel? I don't know if the money really matters, but they're reliant on Intel to make a better chip. And if the chip is not good, they they have to answer the problems. Why is, why is my computer overheating? What's the security problem? All these other things that they can just say, well, it's Intel, not me. So they said, you know what? We're going to make it for ourselves. We have all of this. We have all, we know how to write iOS. We know how to write Mac OS. They're close enough at, I mean, at this point, they're almost identical. They're, they're getting very close to say, why don't we use the one chip and put it across our product lines and we can control literally everything on it. And we can get rid of the licensing fees. We can get rid of the middleman and we can make it just work for you. And I think that's what they're going at. I think they just want to eliminate everyone else except for them and hope that and hope that people will buy it and say, wow, this is a really good product. Yeah, when, when you're a company the size of Apple, um, or, or really, I'm going to say just about any company, in your single source, right? You've got that one distributor that you work with. It's dangerous. It's, it's actually a business risk to only be able to source a component from one manufacturer from, from one place because that company could go under. And then what are you going to do? Like if you're a pizza place and you only buy pizza crust from this one person, if that one guy goes away, you're, you're done, right? You can't get pizza crust anymore. Where are you going to get pizza crust? Now, for stuff like pizza crust, you just get it basically anywhere, right? But uh, for things like processors, there's a pretty 
you know, narrow list of companies that can produce at the, the scale and the speed that you need when you're the size of Apple. Intel is one of those giants. Unfortunately, it does mean that if Intel does something like, you know, jack their prices through the roof, what's Apple going to do? Are they going to say no? They don't really have the option, right? They have to keep buying these chips. If Intel produces chips that lose their performance due to a slew of security issues over, let's say, I don't know, two, two and a half years, uh, what's Apple going to do? Well, they're just kind of stuck with a chip that has security defects and now loses performance thanks to the microcode updates. Not that we're talking about any one particular issue. Meltdown. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, being single sourced is a dangerous business risk. By Apple adding in their uh, their own chipsets and their own IP and their own technology, they now get to balance that out somewhat, right? They're still not completely indemnified, right? People are still going to want Intel chips. And there could be issues with the new ARM stuff that they put out. We haven't seen it, right? It's it's still in process. Um, but it, it does indemnify them a little bit. They have a backup they can run to, which is huge when you're a business. Well, I I thought of this and then I said, it's not really an issue. So does Intel, Intel business drop, doesn't really drop because what we said is that Max uh, contribute to about 5% of total computing. I said, oh, if if uh, if Apple pulls the chips, we've been talking about Google pulling chips, but then again, Google's using ARM anyway at this point. What stay? What stays Intel? And the answer is desktop PCs. Desktop PCs, Windows will still run on Intel for the foreseeable future. I don't see Microsoft dropping Intel anytime soon. I don't think they need to. Um, their Microsoft is now really focusing on the cloud and saying, you know, we just want to give you a product that runs everywhere. So unless you buy Windows, everything else is going to run in the cloud. I think, right? I think so. Um, generally. Yeah. Um, I, so Windows, Microsoft has made Windows run on the ARM platform, right? On the Surface, the, the OG Surface. Um, it runs an ARM chip. Windows runs on ARM. Um, you can do, like they have an emulation layer in there to run 32-bit uh, Windows apps, but people kind of hate it. And because a lot of apps now are compiled for uh, 64-bit platforms and not 32, uh, your you know your available pool of applications is just wilting at this point. Um, but Microsoft could uh, jump to ARM now. Are we going to see you know ARM-based desktop processors to run in the latest hottest gaming rigs? I don't see it frankly, uh, especially with AMD providing some really, really much needed competition to Intel in this space with, uh, you know, the, the Threadripper and Ryzen processors. Um, I don't think ARM is going to really impact the desktop market. And I do think that's kind of where Intel lives and stays at this point. I mean, I see. And so my, my, so Apple now says that they're looking at ARM and my very first reaction is, how am I going to do Microsoft Office? Because that was one of my big keys. I needed to run Microsoft Office. And as we said, if it's not compiled for that, it's a big problem. And the next slide was, oh, we've been talking with Adobe and Microsoft to make this work. So they took care of the two big hot button issues. The only thing that it will drop, at least for the foreseeable future, is boot camp. So you, cannot, you will not be able to boot into Windows on your on your Mac computer. For me, that's not a big deal. Um, I don't want to tell you to buy another piece of hardware, but for 300 bucks, you can get a really decent laptop that will run that will run fairly good for whatever you need Windows for, unless you have something very specific, some very elaborate piece of uh, computing that you, but you were virtualizing that anyway. So I don't know. I, you may have to now just buy yourself a Windows computer to run Windows applications, but. I, I don't think at this point that's a problem that much anymore. Yeah, I, I don't imagine so. The A lot of the stuff that was very Windows specific is now running just about everywhere. And if it's if it doesn't run you know natively on the Mac or on ARM processors, there's probably a web version out there, right? Um, yeah. I have look, I have an I have an appraisal piece of software that is Windows only. They have iPad apps, they have every they have Android apps, but it's Windows only. And okay, so I have to have a Windows computer for that. And okay, 
I don't know too many of those. They do exist. I, I fully admit that, that the MRI machine may, may only be able to run Windows XP, but hopefully the new MRI machines, I mean, they're, they're going to be integrated. They should be running their own OS at this point that is updatable somehow. But They, sh- they should just it. throw a, a Pi Zero in the thing. <laughs> All it done. To pull it out and change it. <laughs> <laughs> like a Nintendo cartridge. But yeah. again, it's... Uh, so, I look... I don't know if this is going to be a good thing. We asked at the beginning of the show. I, I think that it's going to be generally positive. Um, you're going to be able, I have a feeling now that developer, the developers are going to be able to uh, write a piece of software that with a little bit of effort, will be able to run on all three platforms, iOS, um, iPad OS, uh, Mac OS all together. And they can charge once. I mean, they may not help the developer, but it'll definitely help the end user. So you can get, let's say, a Notes app that runs on everything without having to download two different softwares and and get it working. And I think that's what it's going to be because I really think Apple wants you to have a Mac. They want you to have an iPad and they want you to have a phone and a watch. They want you to have everything. But if they're going to have you have everything, they want it all to work. And they don't want to hear that, oh, I have to buy the software for this version or that version. They 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 want it all to work. And the only and Apple's in that uh, position to do it. So so I, I don't again, I think this is a positive. I'm going to say I think this is a positive, at least for consumer facing. I don't know how they're going to do it with developers, but we'll see. Yeah. So for for devs and we'll get into the security implications here in a minute. Believe it or not, we don't have too much on this because it's, it's very much speculation at this point. Um, but with a lot of modern programming languages, if you're looking at you know, a portable C, if you're looking at Go, if you're looking at Rust, a lot of these uh, you know, new languages are designed to be run everywhere. They're designed to be cross-compiled. They're designed to run in you know, kind of whatever architecture or OS you want to put them into. Um, and not to say that everything works everywhere all the time and everyone's happy because there are edge cases to everything. Um, I, I do this for a living, right? I deal with edge cases on a daily basis. But if I write something in Go on my Linux computer, you know, on, on a Linux ARM computer, I can make that run on Windows on x86. Um, I could cross compile to Darwin or, or Mac OS and you know, get it to run on whatever future ARM chip that they put out uh, really, really easily. Not all languages are like that, but modern programming languages and modern applications theoretically should have an easier time moving between platforms than we saw back in the PowerPC days. Um, back in the PowerPC days, uh, Apple did release this tool called Rosetta. It was an emulation layer. It was fine. You generally lost a whole lot of performance. It, it wasn't, uh, you know, great for for every piece of software but if there was something that you really needed to run that was only available on power pc and you really needed it to run on your new intel mac rosetta filled that gap in many cases apple is doing that again they're releasing rosetta 2 uh, and they actually showed a pretty impressive tech demo of uh, a new a new tomb raider game running on the intel mac and running on you know an arm mac through rosetta 2 and it was playable um Pretty, pretty cool, especially since the Mac is not and has never been known as a gaming machine. Um, so you, you do get these uh, kind of uh, quite literally an emulation layer running on top of your brand new MacBook with your brand new shiny processor to make stuff that you did use before work on here. Um, now, uh, as far as the support, they said they'll support Intel for a number of years. They left that intentionally vague. So... Look, if you're looking for a new computer, um, buy whatever you want now. That's fine. Um, I would step it down. So I would, I would buy a computer now, expecting to buy another computer in less than five years. So if you're buying a fully tricked out MacBook Pro 16 inch that's four grand or whatever, I would look at in less than five years having to replace it. So go into it knowing that if you want to stay with the Mac. You're going to have to do it. So maybe you get a really good deal on one of the crappy keyboard, butterfly keyboard Macs, or instead of going MacBook Pro, you go uh, MacBook Air for the time being, or get something refurbished. Because they are saying two years, everything is going to move. And they did say everything, not ev- almost everything. So so and I would just be aware of that. You don't want to get stuck where they say, hey, uh, sorry, we're done. 
And if it's anybody who's going to force the developers to change, it's going to be Apple because you have this. And all of a sudden, I don't see too many developers saying, hey, uh, we're not going to develop for this. They said it's going to be uh, supremely easy. You have Rosetta 2. So I, I, I think that if you have to buy something now, step it down a little bit and go with something that you're going to that you're okay replacing in a few years now for the security implications and it's it's really hard to talk about this without you know the, the hardware in front of us or without hackers bashing on this thing for years like they have with intel right you take a look at intel you've got spectre you've got meltdown you've got all these speculative execution vulnerabilities you've got like my my amazing gaming pc that i built last year and has lost about 30 percent of its performance thanks to all the uh the vulnerabilities which makes me feel fantastic my wife's new gaming pc is running uh, an amd processor and so far it's keeping up so uh that was better than the the week of full performance i got with my my intel processor not that i'm mad about that or anything i'm a little mad but um just because it's a new chipset just because it's arm does not mean we get out of the speculative execution vulnerability game Right, since Apple is designing these things, you know, fairly new. Um, hopefully, they are in a place where they are looking at the kind of security gaps that Intel has made and trying to avoid those. It's not a guarantee that it will happen. However, um, we'll have to wait and see. Unfortunately, uh, ARM chips have been affected by speculative execution vulnerabilities. Um, not very many, but there have been cases out there that showed. Yep this thing is affected by specter meltdown whatever right this thing is affected by this class of vulnerability we're not guaranteed to get out of that game but moving away from intel to me it's a little bit of a positive but again without people bashing on the hardware itself we're not going to know and we probably won't know for some time and if it's a hardware bug it's much harder to fix than obviously a software bug and as we've seen, it's easier to update Chrome or update your operating system just to mitigate it, not fix it. And we'll, we'll see how that works. Um, yep. We hope, I look, I, I want this to be a good thing. Um, I don't think we needed to move off Intel. I think the status quo was fine. But I, I always told people, wait for the next MacBook Pro, uh, MacBook update and nobody can tell you when that is and i don't know if that's a company issue or a intel chip issue but as intel re uh, releases new chips they should update the entire product line within fairly short order and so you know oh in september october the new laptops come out in uh, in march the ipads come out in september the phones come like have some sort of process because as you know apple doesn't drop prices and and everything else so Hopefully this, this becomes a more stable system. And like I said, we'll go. Uh, we are over time, but I just want to tell, I just want to say two last things. First, you have any more questions? Our WhatsApp group, we have it, we're, we're there. Uh, find me on Twitter, I'll throw you in. Uh, the other thing is I bought Tom's recommendation on a, a, a cold brew and I'm absolutely loving it. I bought um, the, the cold brew. I now use that for my afternoon uh, coffee. So I drink a little bit of that and I set another one for the next day. So I don't have to, I guess, I am reducing a little bit of my coffee intake knowing that I have iced coffee in the afternoon. So I will just say that. Any parting words, Tom, before we go? Iced coffee is delicious. Okay, so uh, again, I hope you learned something. I hope we didn't lie or I hope we didn't say too many inaccuracies. We will correct them as you, if you tell us. So just let us know, and uh, hopefully we will see you next week. See you, everyone. Bye.